Hi, welcome to Three Beers IT, a home for disinhibited conversations about the world of IT. The things that maybe don't get said until folks are on their third beer, or equivalent, of course. Three Beers IT urges listeners of legal age to drink responsibly and to not spill because it shorts out the equipment and it stinks up the HVAC. Now, today I'm drinking a Guinness and I'm drinking it out of a Guinness glass. Normally I don't get one in here, but um, this time it's the real thing. Nice. I'm John Burke. I'm CTO at Nemertis. I've been 16 years an analyst here. And before that, I spent about 18 years as an IT guy, doing everything from writing software to managing network and data center teams to enterprise architecture. And joining me today is Jerry Murphy, Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting here at Nemertis. Care to introduce yourself further there, Jerry? Sure. Uh, Jerry Murphy, uh, I have about 30 years of uh, IT experience, and I've done everything from helping MCI build their part of the internet backbone back in the mid 90s when the internet went public, uh, building large global data centers, running a consulting for a Fortune 500 company, uh, building global data centers, uh, to most recently being CEO of a managed service company where we were providing uh, uh, network security and collaboration infrastructure for financial services companies. Um, and as far as my drinking, one of my favorites, which I'm gonna go with today, is an 18-year-old Tausker from the Isle of uh, Skye, uh, which is very nice. And while most of you know the Elays tend to be the, the peatier ones, there you go, a ring with my Lismore crystal into the pot it goes. Uh, I really like the Tasker. The Tasker 18-year-old can be kind of peaty, which is kind of nice. And if you're a good protectioner, you take your crystal vase of filtered water and put a nice splash in there to open up the nose. I have it in a cognac glass, but this is a single malt scotch deserving of a cognac glass. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, sir. You can almost smell it from here. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for joining me today. So... We wanted to talk today about, and I say we in the, in the sort of larger institutional sense, I wanted to talk today about innovation. And it's something that uh, is a perennial concern nowadays with enterprise IT. It got onto IT's radar 10, 12 years ago uh, in the rush of uh, a, a need to justify the continued existence of enterprise IT because there was this this big trope going around for a while that it was all just commodity services. And, and if you if you weren't doing something special, what was the point of even having your own IT organization? Just outsource it all and be done. So that whole mess kind of dovetailed with the digital transformation movement that is, is still uh, distorting uh, strategies and uh, shaping futures uh, across the IT landscape. You've had a long and varied career as an analyst, both with us and, and with the Meta Group once upon a time. You, you've worked as a scientist and researcher and you've, you've worked with various vendors and service providers. So you've seen innovation from every angle. Is there a right way to do it for enterprise IT? That's a great question, uh, John. And um, what I tend to say is more like, I don't know if I know a right way to do it, but I certainly know a bunch of ways not to do it. Uh, what, I, what I tend to say, um, what I would say is innovation is appropriate when it can be used to as either a, a catalyst to facilitate transformation across the business or when you can provide concrete transformative business value. The problem with innovation becomes if you're doing innovation for innovation's sake, it's almost always a mistake. And a quick example is, uh, let's look at IP telephony, right? Mm -hmm. when, when IP telephony first happened, there was this concept of, wow, you know, I can, you know, do all of my network and my telephony on one network. And before we, you know, before we had IP telephony, you had the telephone network, which was one network. And you had the data network, which starting pretty much with the internet, you know, was a separate network. And so conceptually, you're like, wow, 
these two networks, I'm spending t theoretically twice as much money. If I had one network, it would theoretically be half as much money. So I'm going to save all this money. And the answer is, if I have no network, it costs less money to build one network than to build two networks. But if I already have two networks, it actually costs me money to make them one network. So while it sounded good in theory, in practice, it costs you a lot of money to do that transformation. So if you never had a network, by all means, build a consolidated network. And I think so often that's the problem with implementing transformation is people are uh, the the prognosticators of we're going to you know implement cloud computing we're going to implement quantum computing we're going to implement I don't care what it is yeah if you have nothing putting one thing in might be great but inevitably any transformation technology is is going to very often be replacing or supplanting something you already have that is people who are trained in the technology Mm -hmm. A sunk cost on things that I'm still depreciating the value of it. And so I guess that's what I'd say is you need to be thinking about how how is the business going to value this transformation? What's the cost of this transformation going to be there? And if I can show there's actually a concrete return on investment that isn't in decades, then it might make sense. And I, I think that's very often what people miss. And it sounds good. And they start implementing it. And then they get hit across the shoals of practicality or capital limitations or lack of training. And that vision, which sounded so great by the futurist or the vendor who is giving you the technology to zero, you know, that's what ends up happening. And so often the promise of it, you know, just doesn't seem to happen for five or 10 or 15 years. And that's why. It's funny that you bring up the, the void. Uh, example because oh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, in my previous gig, we were early adopters of VoIP and um, ran into you know exactly the kind of uh, startup costs that were definitely downplayed by vendors. They'd get to talking about them if you pushed and pushed, but yeah, yeah if you weren't running on Cat five everywhere, you had issues. If you were running right. on Cat three in some places, you had a lot of issues. If some of that cat three was split between multiple terminations, you had a world of trouble. Even um, the promise of the internet itself, John, is same kind of thing, right? And today, the internet's ubiquitous. Oh, we all have internet. But th but if you look back at the the instantiation of the internet, or let's just say networking in general, when it was first built, there were no standards, right? It's like every computer company had its own network, right? DEC had DECnet uh, and LAT. <laughs> IBM had Systems Network Architecture, SNA, oh, yeah. um, uh, and, and uh, Apple had Apple Talk. Literally, everybody had their own network, right? So, again, you go, hey, there, here's this standard thing called the Internet, the Internet Pro called TCP IP. But, you know, it, it, again, it took training. It took learning. Um, it was not something that was just, oh, we're going to put this in and everything's going to be honky dory. It, it, I mean, it happened pretty quickly, but it certainly did not happen uh, as overnight as it looks now. You know, twenty five years uh, in the in the rearview mirror. If if you uh, take it from the internet as as the interconnection uh, amongst companies uh, down to the IP protocol becoming the default for pretty much everything. It's still not quite, I, I mean, because uh, there's still a lot of fiber channel storage out there in the world, and there's still, you know, high performance computing specialty protocols out there. IP is always, it's like this acid ocean uh, gradually oh. eroding everything else, but it- And it's kind of less and less. Been. It was much more stochastic in the beginning. I mean, oh, when yeah. I was that yeah. guy literally building this in the mid nineties, I'd like to say what we had at MCI was what I call a ready fire aim attitude. We built one of everything <laughs> and whatever, whatever people bought, we like dump more money into it. So now it's like the internet standard, but we had, you remember ATM asynchronous transfer mode, oh, SMS yeah. switched multi-megabit data service X.25, which actually was in the retail for quite a long time for doing oh, yeah. credit card transactions. 
uh, frame relay. I mean, there's all these leased lines with, you know, just T1s, which was a time multiplex service. We had a bunch of things down there. And there was still you know, standards with something that it was very, very rocky in the beginning. And, and trying to figure out which one was going to, quote, win. Uh, I mean, even things like SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. I mean, Jeff Case built that up, but at the beginning, not only did every system have its own networking protocol, but everything had its own proprietary management as well. So, so it took quite a while to get all that stuff standardized. So there's a couple of, of things to tease out. And one is the other funny part about bringing up VoIP as an example. Uh, and that is that uh, it was actually one of Namurti's early research discoveries, basically, that the real business case for VoIP wasn't about consolidating your networks. Like you said, if you were building from scratch, sure, there was a business case for having just one built instead of two. But it was, strangely enough, on the moves, ads, and changes. You, as an enterprise, a large enterprise, could save enormous buckets of cash doing move, ad, change activity on a VoIP system when compared to the old system. Yep. And uh, it took far less time than anybody expected to recoup oh. your costs from those costs alone. Oh, sure. And that's something that people, you know, you're like, oh, Cisco's doing IP telephony. And they were one of the early adopters, right, of, of IP telephony. But the reality was, yes, it's consolidated. But when you look at Cisco's expertise in call engineering, they didn't have it. They knew how to do <laughs> networking. They could move packets. They could use UDP to move a packet. But they didn't understand what Erlangs were, right? They didn't actually understand a call busy minutes and how to set up priority switching uh, and all that kind of stuff. They just didn't understand it. So, um, so yes, they could do it over uh, over the data network, but the quality was very very poor. They didn't understand packet prioritization uh, in in the same way uh, that you need to do it on. Uh, UDP compared to TCP. So there was a lot of things that took uh, quite a, uh, you know, years and years of growing pains before you could say their call quality was anything comparable to what you could get with uh, Avaya or Nortel at the time. And that brings up yet another interesting point. But um, so the second interesting point that the, the VoIP exam or the VoIP and then the IP example brings up is it's hard to pick winners in advance. Um, you know, oh. innovations come along and sometimes it's you know early mover advantage and they're they're just off and running and and like an idea mainframe there's not much competition uh at the early stages so they get huge and become a standard right. other times as with tcp ip there's lots of competition everybody's got their horse in the race and yeah it's hard to pick in advance and I have a couple of thoughts on do. that right and, and the interest, and here's what i'd say about that and in, in my experience doing this for decades is that the winner isn't what's the best. The winner is what the market thinks is the best. And that's not the same thing as what is the best. I mean, not look at, for example, on the PCs, right? It's like Microsoft is like the dominant winner of the operating system initially for desktop and then ultimately on servers. But frankly, as a guy who whose background is electrical engineering, computer engineering, you couldn't pick a worse operating system than DOS. But why did DOS win? Because initially when Bill Gates got licensing to use the hardware, IBM is like, oh, we don't care about the software because the thing that they had an experience that made the money was the hardware from their mainframe business. So they didn't see the value in the software. That's one of the things that, that Bill Gates had the vision is not that DOS was a great operating system. I mean, freak, you know, DEC was better. OS2 was better. You know, there's plenty of operating. Linux, you know, as a transform of Unix on uh, CISC chips was better. But, you know, the thing that he had was he realized the software is the differentiator. And I don't care what the hardware is, right? I don't care if it's running on Acer or Packard Bell or an IBM, and the, the deal was, well, IBM, it's going to be called PC-DOS. Every other computer, it's going to be called MS-DOS. But the important part is the DOS, not the PC part of it. 
And, and of course, that ended up being uh, the differentiator. But again, he one of it was he had a great business deal with IBM that let his software get on top of their hardware. But more importantly, then, from a marketing standpoint, everybody's writing code for, for Microsoft. And I think one of the things that made um, Apple take so long, and it really took, you know, the iPhone to, to really make, you know, Apple ultimately successful was the fact that it was proprietary in order for Apple to work, you needed their hardware, their keyboard, their monitor, they owned all of that. And because they it worked good, but it was at a 2x premium to what you could get where Microsoft was like, I don't care, you could get an Acer, you could get a Dell, you know, I don't care what you put it on. Uh, and it made it a lot cheaper. Now, it was a lot more buggy, but for the end, individual individual user, good enough. <laughs> And all of a sudden, it's the dominant operating system, right? And good enough, that is really the key. And again, yeah. the VoIP, what we found out was you didn't need the call quality to be exactly as good as what you could get from Nortel or Avon. And, and what do we have to thank that for? The cell phone. The cell phone. Because we were used to AT&T landline quality with the old landline, but... Once we started having cell phones, we got used to crappy quality. And it's like, well, I guess that's good enough because I'm tolerating it here. Even to this day, I live in Princeton, New Jersey. And guess where our cell coverage is horrible? Princeton doesn't want an ugly cell tower anywhere near this bucolic town. So the worst <laughs> is when I'm actually in my house in Princeton. But you know. if you ever find your way to Minneapolis and can come visit the house, I'll show you the one cubic foot volume on the third floor of my house where I can get good Verizon reception. <laughs> it hasn't moved in, in a long time. Um, yeah. But that, you know, the cell phone taught us that voice quality isn't as important as access and VoIP was able to capitalize on that learning um, sort of as it, as it was unfolding. And we've seen that with other kinds of innovations in the IT space where something new comes along and it doesn't do absolutely everything the old thing did, but it does some interesting new things uh, and, and can upset the apple cart by really helping people sort out what's essential to them and what's just something that they're used to. Uh, like uh, we have a client who's um, looking at deploying a software defined perimeter solution and it needs to um, it needs to, I'm sorry, they mean for it to, in part, replace their VPN solution. Uh, and they're trying desperately amongst the folks who want to see the SDP implemented to avoid having a head-to-head -head comparison with the VPN solution because feature for feature, it doesn't do all the same things. So if the VPN advocates put together the testing regimen, it will fail. But it does all the important things for controlling access to resources that have very yep. stringent access requirements. Yep. So if you can pay attention to what's necessary, as opposed to what you're used to, right. you can really take advantage of innovation. And, and as an adjunct to that, bringing up a practical example of what to do with new technology, right, is zero trust network architecture, right? That's a big thing you hear people talking about now is we, and it's fundamentally, in some senses, you could say it's shaking at least the networking community, right? Because when you look at security, historically it was very network focused. I have a firewall and everybody inside the firewall is good and anybody outside the firewall is bad and the firewalls are my moat around my business. People are really realizing now, you know, what I'm protecting is not the network of my company. What I'm protecting is the data and the information that my company has. Right. And with COVID, people are not necessarily inside of my secure castle enterprise anymore. They're wherever they are. They're at their house that are at Starbucks. You know, they're getting a chicken dinner from Popeye's drive through wherever the heck they are, you know. But it's like, I don't really care where John is, but is it John? And just because John works at my company doesn't mean John has access to everything at my company. You know, if, if he's in operations, he doesn't necessarily have any business getting into the, my financial data, for example, right? So it's really data-centric things. So, but it's like, well, and you have a lot of these vendors now, you know, like AppGate with their SDP saying, oh, I'm integral to zero trust. But just like my example, if you got two, two networks that cost you money to make one, 
nobody's going to throw out everything they have to implement a from scratch zero trust network architecture but what you can do is say as i put my as i'm replacing widget x with widget y let's make sure widget y is zero trust network compatible so that it, it meets the standards of the future architecture without breaking what i got today that way i can have a migration plan that lets me get to zero trust but i'm doing it without throwing away the baby and all the bathwater i currently have invested in yeah so i guess it's important to make decisions like that around the time the baby's bathwater is about to expire um so you can yes. try and time obsolescence with uh, retirement um which yeah. is probably a theme i should not think about too much and hopefully more the babies <laughs> too big for my little bathwater sink thing I got him in. <laughs> so it sounds like if there's no uh, one way to do enterprise innovation right, there are definitely some ways to do it wrong. And uh, they include trying to pick winners too early. Yes. And thinking that you'll know upfront what all the value propositions from a new technology right. or a new uh, process might or, be. Or, or picking a technology is it because I can do it. Just because I can actually do something doesn't mean I should do it. If I can build a trap that absolutely positively will trap and capture an ivory build woodpecker, that's great. But if you have no ivory build woodpeckers, why buy it? And alas, none of us do. That's a, a sad. Well, I'm Jerry. as a as a amateur ornithologist. I'm I'm holding out hope that it still exists somewhere in the swamps of Texarkana or Florida, someplace. And part of my as I retire, one of my things will be trying to find the last remaining one. But <laughs> that said, <laughs> my point being, you, you know. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it actually makes sense to do it. Absolutely. And wow, uh, that's about all we have time for today. Uh, Jerry, thanks so much for joining me. And thanks everybody who's my watching. Pleasure. And thanks for giving me a chance to uh, have some sips of some of my favorite uh, beverage, even if it wasn't beer. And I don't mean to cast dispersions on your fine Guinness, uh, but I will hang on to my single malt while I can. Uh, I, I have nothing but envy for the single malt you are drinking. That <laughs> is good stuff. Uh, so uh, with that, everybody, thanks. And until next time, I'm John Burke, and this has been Three Beers IT. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>